Oops. Thank you very much, Ms. Hudson, for this kind introduction and for the invitation to come here, but I'd also take the opportunity to thank Science Business for the excellent cooperation we have, which is very, very inspiring and important, particularly this juncture when we set the pace for the further development of Europe. I was tempted again and again to jump in when Commissioner Oettinger spoke so convincingly about the need to shape the future. And uh, let's be honest, as Europeans, we have been busy with crisis management for the last decade. We have been, to a large extent, looking inward during these times. We have been worried about spreads between member states of the European Union, the capital markets. We have been worried about exchange rate developments vis-a-vis -vis non euro countries and all these things. We are more, uh, very, very much worried about Brexit and the potential risks still ahead before we are sure to have a withdrawal agreement with the United Kingdom and an idea how to shape the future with our friends in the United Kingdom. So these are very, very difficult challenges. And at this, in view of these challenges, you might sometimes run the risk of overlooking the question of Europe's role in the world. And Europe's role in the world its political role, which obviously is changing in view of the geotectonic changes visible right now, also in view of the um, big question mark behind the continuity of this great idea of the West, of the community of enlightenment-based, rule of law-based democracy, market-oriented countries of this world. These challenges are, are very, very serious. And we might not always be aware what we need to do in order to preserve our political clout in this world. But beyond that, it is legitimate and necessary to think about the economic dimension of this as well. And in particular, the economic dimension, and also the political dimension, of course, are very closely linked to our technological position in this world and our competitiveness. And you cannot miss Lisbon targets for so many years. And the Commissioner was very right. We have member states which are barely above 1% of GDP for research, development, and innovation, which cannot be compensated by a few others who might be a couple of per mils above 3%. You cannot miss these targets. Overall, over the last 10 years, each year, at least between 1% and 1.5% of GDP per year in comparison to our partners in Asia and North America without having a lasting impact on our competitiveness. Our productivity growth has been suffering over the last 10 years. That has an impact on our competitiveness. And we must fix that if Europe wants to play a role in the world of the next decade, decades. And nothing is more important than the cap capacity of our societies to modernize themselves and to modernize our economies. So I think it is uh, not, not necessary to convince you that innovation, that science, that research lie at the core of whatever answer we are going to come up with. But when we take a look at the policy debate at the moment, it appears that there are still a number of people for whom the need to invest more in innovation is less obvious than it should be. And I agree, the budgets will not grow. Uh, maybe one could say it unfortunately, but sometimes it's a blessing as well because you concentrate on priorities and you are more creative in finding solutions. And if the commissioner very rightly says, we need to make more out of less, then this equation will be, surprise, will be convincing only if we achieve it a situation where we, to put it in one simple word, use more leverage. And when it comes to leverage, I have the pleasure to represent an institution which is second to none. Because the mobilization of public funds for public 
goods is, of course, the natural role of a policy-driven institution like EIB, which is at the same time a bank that is fully financed on the capital markets and has, therefore, to be very, very professional as a bank. But the other side of the coin is that this institution's main job is to make sure that we leverage into the private sector and that we crowd in the private sector in order to finance the objectives or the, the means in order to achieve the objectives that we are talking about. So also crowding in the private sector in order to do more for research, innovation and development. And by the way, education, because that's one of the weakest spots in Europe presently, including my own country. So we have to look, take a closer look at that, in particular in view of the fact and when I complained about 1 to 1.5% of GDP directed towards innovation, research, and development over the last 10 years, each and every year, I'm mainly talking about the private sector. I could make nasty remarks about the public sector as well. But what worries me in particular is the lack of innovative and research activities in the private sector. Of course, you can all name a couple of hundred lighthouses that we have in Europe businesses which are world market leaders. But uh, there are a few more who are doing relatively little and or cannot do much more. Because one of the big challenges for European small and medium sized businesses is that on the one hand, many of them are extremely innovative and invest in research development and innovation but then they don't have the growth potential to bring their newly developed products to the market and make a big company out of a small seed. And then the most innovative ideas at the end of the day will end up in Asia or North America and will be market, marketed there or from there. So this, therefore, I'm convinced that financing of innovation and financing of growth of innovative companies is one of the key challenges we'll have to address in the years to come. I'm far from saying that Europe is back in, this, in crisis mode, but taken together, recent events have reminded us that there is still some unfinished business left over from the crisis years. For me, the most worrying one is the structural, and, the structural weaknesses and imbalances in Europe's economy that remain to be tackled. They again put the spotlight on the fact that the competitiveness of Europe's economy is still far from where it needs to be. Ignoring this negative outlook for a moment, it, is also, it also needs to be said that Europe has come a long way. Courageous policy decisions since 2012 have helped the recovery get off the ground and put our economy back on track. Member States, the Commission, Parliament, but of course the ECB have worked closely together to stimulate growth and employment. The result? Investment has picked up, in part also. Please allow me to make that remark uh, as one of the creators of this idea. Helped by investment initiatives such as Jean-Claude Juncker, Jean Juncker's investment plan for Europe, which uh, was developed when Mr. Juncker had lost the national election and was thinking about a candidacy for the presidency of the European Commission and needed ideas, and we developed them. It was a very courageous step, because at that time, not me, myself, but our experts, economists, engineers, <laughs> bankers, they had to come up with an, with an estimate what kind of leverage can be achieved. And at that time we said, okay, in view of the experiences we had before with a simple capital increase, very limited one, because we are by far the most leveraged bank in the, in the world, making a balance sheet of 600 billion euros out of 14 billion cashed in. That's quite substantial. But we then said after these experiences, we would say that for the purposes of the Juncker plan, a multiplier of 15 is a realistic choice. We are just a few weeks before the end of the period for which the Juncker plan was designed which, by the way, is called Juncker Plan only after a couple of months when it showed that it would work. Until then, they preferred other names. <laughs> um, 
we are sh short before the end of our period, and uh, I can assure you that uh, we will have achieved it by the end of the day. So it is an instrument that is quite in interesting, and we should take it into consideration when we think about future developments also in research and development financing. Secondly, instead of growing closer together, Europe's economy continues to diverge between and within member states. Growth remains unbalanced. Look at, the, for instance, this case of Italy, which is on everybody's mind right now. Italy has such a strong economic, intellectual, technological, industrial landscape, however, only in a part of the country. And the other one is left far behind. By the way, that was the part of the country which was the reason for our political leaders in 1956 to think about the, invest, the, the installation of this European Investment Bank, now we say the EU Bank. Because at that time, the idea after, after the damages of World War II, it was let's, let's give some help to those parts of Europe which have not, had not been benefiting from the Marshall Plan as well as, for instance, my own country has been, had been doing. So the Mezzogiorno basically was the, 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 the core idea of the foundation of the European Investment Bank, and the job still has not been done. Just as well as the second objective of the EU Bank, according to the EU Treaty, of first of Rome and then of Lisbon, has not been achieved fully because the second objective set in the EU treaty is to contribute to the formation of a common market. Well, the common market, a great achievement, fantastic success, covers roughly 50% of the GDP of the member states of the European Union, not more. So also there still a lot needs to be done. A reminder, while unemployment levels in general have come down from their peak during the crisis, youth unemployment has remained stubbornly high in many, mostly southern member states. And there you have to look closer, because even at the peak of the economic upswing, the beginning of the millennium, for instance in Spain, youth unemployment was shockingly high. And still is today, although the economy in Spain has fantastically recovered. So there is obviously a structural problem. And don't try to fight structural problems with counter-cyclical measures. Uh, you will not succeed. So we have to be more creative on this. It seems that we are still, or again, locked in a low-investment, low-growth, vicious circle that prevents companies, individuals, and the state from living up to their potential. An absurd situation that none of us can accept. Without running the risk of repeating myself, Europe needs more, much more, investments into our future. In order to stop the productivity gap widening further and reverse it, yes, we must have the ambition to reverse it and not just be complacent with maybe stopping it. We need quality investments in education, research, and innovation. Why? In view of high youth unemployment, we need more and better education, including vocational training, is rather obvious. But a serious discussion of this issue would distract us too much from our topic today. Instead, I will focus on science, research, and innovation that have historically been the main engines of wealth creation. Given the breathtaking pace of digitalization, which, by the way, has not been realized in all member states of the European Union fully, Given the breathtaking pace of digitalization, advances in life sciences and materials, their importance as drivers of productivity growth is, likely, is unlikely to diminish in future. However, what we are missing at the moment is the determination with which Europe seizes the opportunities that this age of technology offers. More than ever before, we need to step up investments in innovation. The scale of the challenge is daunting. If Europe wants to catch up with the US and the leading economies in Asia, we need to lift investments in innovation, R&D, digitalization of our economy and education by about 300 billion euros a year. 300 per year. Most of it, about two thirds, would have to come from the private sector. The gap is particularly large in life sciences, software and artificial intelligence, and digital infrastructure such as ultra-speed broadband, supercomputing, 
and data centers for the cloud as main innovation enablers. This is what I would call the long-term or the strategic dimension of investment. I would like to underline this point because the, there are still quite a few people out there who doubt whether spending in this area should count as investment. Yet another point is important as well. Innovation implies commercialization. Innovation has become a large-scale industrial business, often carried out by massive companies which need to invest billions of euros and devote hundreds of staff, thousands of staff, to an industrial process of innovation. As you are all too well aware, innovation is no longer about a bright idea, at least not only. It is the result of the operation of an investment machine. So there is a problem with this investment machine. I alluded to it already, particularly in Europe, small companies. EIB's investment survey, based on feedback from 12,000 companies across Europe, which we asked to respond individually, 12,000, discovered that large firms are twice as likely as SMEs to become innovators. Innovative young firms are 50% more likely than other firms to be credit constrained. The big failure in Europe at the moment is that even if a small company has an innovative idea, it is phenomenally hard for that company to become a large innovator. In Europe, we have these large old innovators, but as we know, we lack the Googles and Amazons. But small firms may introduce an innovative product, but they lack of growth finance. They lack growth finance and in a very stringent business environment are unable to invest and to grow. A lack of small new innovators may reduce the introduction of truly radical breakthrough innovations. It is these innovations that lay the foundations for completely new markets, of course. The lack of such small new innovators may also reduce innovation at larger firms because they do not face the competitive challenge of meeting new ideas. Nor do they have the opportunity to acquire and improve on the ideas of these smaller firms. And this has become a real issue that holds back Europe back. Developing new technologies is no longer enough. Too often, we have been proven wrong. Think of the pioneering role that small companies in Europe played in developing solar PV and wind power. Today, the largest equipment supplier, suppliers are located in Asia. In order to harvest the fruits of our work, we need to invest continuously in keeping our innovators and innovations competitiveness, competitive. This is especially true when it comes to those areas where Europe still, I underline still, is among the leaders. Automotive, mobile telecoms, equipment, and automation sectors. The challenge here is to come forward with business models that combine our strengths in product development and manufacturing with value propositions that are attractive enough for customers worldwide. Electric mobility, Mobile robotics, autonomous driving, smart grids, and e-medicine are all examples of system technologies that require an integrated, interdisciplinary approach and huge amounts and huge investments that run into the billions of euros per year to maintain our leading positions. In that sense, I very much welcome the Commission's proposal for the next MFF, but only because it exceeds even the optimistic expectations of people like me who are convinced that we meet, need more Europe and definitely not less. No, it also sets the right priorities. Needless to add, I'm more than happy about the budget ideas on Horizon Europe. Still, while 100 billion euros over seven years is a lot, it is equally clear that even if we add the large funds provided by the national governments, much more funding would still be needed to lift Europe's innovation investments to the required level. To my mind, one answer to how to tackle the issue lies in a smart combination of public and private money, a model, a model that the EU bank epitomizes like no other institution in Europe. We are a crowding, institu crowding in institution that with only 14 billion euros allows itself in debt on the markets of 500 billion EIB bonds flying around the world to finance all what we are doing. So it is not state money that 
enables us to finance all these activities of roughly 80 billion euros per year. It is the capital markets who have the trust in the institution to give us their money in order to invest in these purposes. And we have gone even further. On top of our normal business, we developed together with the European Commission almost 20 years ago dedicated financial instruments, first for research and innovation, and nowadays expanded to a broad range of sectors. The basic idea is simple. A small part of public funds, earmarked for science, research, and innovation, is used as a backstop, or technically a guarantee, for equity and debt financing of investments in innovation. Public funds that could otherwise be provided only once as a grant are instead deployed as risk capital in the fund that it used to bring in, in, used to bring in additional funds from private investors. The fund is revolving in the sense that repayments of principal plus returns to interest or equity participations are high enough to compensate for the expected losses from defaults. This approach allows us to recycle the public funds and amplify their impact, and that's what we call leveraging. This experience of joint risk financing or risk sharing financial instruments between the Commission and the EIB, or let's be more precise, between the European Union and the EIB, has demonstrated that the concept does not only work in principle, no, it has worked in practice over and over again. The long list of successful instruments, and if you allow me to add, grateful promoters, under the risk sharing finance facility RSFF, Innofin, and the most recent one, FC, the European Fund for Strategic Investments, should be proof enough. I am convinced that if we are serious about stepping up investments in innovation in Europe, risk sharing financial instruments are the most powerful tools we have in our toolbox because public funds will remain limited. If I draw the comparison between our innovation needs and the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, including our big climate goals of Paris, you cannot raise taxes in the world as high as would, that would be necessary if you want to achieve these objectives without crowding in the private sector. No state money in the world will enable the member states of the European Union to bring about their contribution to achieving the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So there is no surprise that this holds true for investment into innovation as well. So let me summarize the key advantage of the three words, multiplication, crowding in, and recycling. Multiplication means that a relatively modest amount of public funds is sufficient to make available a much larger funding package that can be used to finance innovation. Crowding in refers to the fact that risk-sharing financial instruments de-risk instru investments to an extent that make them safe enough for private investors, such as, for instance, pension funds. Finally, recycling indicates the revolving nature of the funds. Whereas grants can only be spent once, there is a non negligible likelihood, and I'm very cautious here, that reflows from financial instruments are large enough to allow for at least a partial redeployment. Having said this, I should, of course, also mention that there are parts of the science innovation system where risk-sharing financial instruments have no role to play. I am aware of that very, very much from the discussions we had on the Juncker plan a couple of years ago, when Commissioner Moidas was courageous enough to even sacrifice budget money from Horizon 2020, a limited amount, but very painful for those research institutions who fully rely upon public funds. So there are areas where my ideas of leveraging and of the combination of public and private funds will not work. We are aware of this, so we have to differentiate what we are talking about. So don't worry. I don't want to take the grant money or see the grant money taken away from areas where they are the only reliable source for financing of innovation also in the future. So to be totally clear, equity or loans to fund the work of the ERC are not the way to go. The ERC and the activities it funds have to rely on grants. There is no alternative. On the other hand, once the potential for commercialization of a new idea appears on the horizon, financial instruments could be a suitable tool. The risk capital they provide allows one to put together a larger financial package that enables the promoter to take a new idea through the last phases of invest development, test it on the market, and if successful, build up, for example, 
the first manufacturing line before selling it to China from the beginning. Allow me to present some figures. RSFF, the first of the financial instruments dedicated to R&D and innovation, supported investments of more than 30 billion euros with only 1 billion euros of funds under FP7 plus 1 billion euros from the EU bank. By the way, the reflows from RSFF are now recycled into two high-impact facilities, one for R&D to fight infectious diseases, the other one aimed at funding demonstration projects using new energy technology, both areas where access to funding remains a huge obstacle. FC, since its inception in 2015, has supported about 100 billion euros of investments in R&D, innovation and digitalization, more than a third of all investments supported. The multiplier effect is close to an effect expected factor of 15 I talked about. In other words, the EU Bank has converted 6.7 billion euros of EU guarantee into financing that allows projects with a total volume of 100 billion euros to go ahead. These aggregate figures hide the hundreds of individual investments, each of them a fascinating piece of evidence that Europe could be among the world leaders in innovation, provided we give our scientists engineers and entrepreneurs the breathing space, and that's, at the end of the day, the funding they need. I'm aware that some of you might find my proposals problematic as they could take away much-needed grant funding on which a large part of especially the academic work depends. Be convinced I'm not targeting that. At the same time, I'm convinced that high investments in innovation are the best and perhaps the only way for Europe's economy and by the way, Europe's society at large, to maintain our wealth and role in the world. And that means strengthening or restoring our competitiveness in the world, both economically and politically. Thank you very much.